So hello and welcome along to another edition of Isolation Interviews for Hospital Radio and for my YouTube channel. And I'm super excited that my guest today is the fantastic Sharon Marshall, or Queen of the Soaps, we should say. How are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for inviting me, Matthew. I've been so impressed with all the names that you've had coming along to do your interviews. So I'm, I'm just chuffed you asked me. It's an absolute pleasure to have you along. Um, now, obviously, we must start off by talking about the last year and a half. How's it been for you? How have you coped with the ever-changing world we live in? Um, well, I've got I, I've got two jobs. One's been easy, one's been harder. Um, so the one that people probably know more about is, is uh, for the last 18 years I've been on this morning um, as their, their soap correspondent I do entertainment, which is... To be honest, it's been just the same in lockdown. It's been dead easy. Um, I just sit there, I watch the telly, and the only things we've had to come from from home. So it's been a, a case of um, trying, hoping that this one here isn't isn't barking too much. My dog, um, praying that a postman won't arrive or something won't happen as I'm going on air. But that's that's been fine. It's it's all gone fine. But the other um, half of my job is um, my trade is a, a scriptwriter. Um, so I used to work for write for EastEnders, now I write for Emmerdale, and that has been so hard. Um, I have to say the people, the people, the bosses, how they've kept that, go, that show going and kept all the shows going. I mean, we never came off air at Emmerdale, um, and that has been very difficult because, first of all, we had to do, um, we try to work out how we did it. I think we did two weeks where we only had two people in the episodes and we stood two metres apart. Then we started bringing people in and trying to work out ways in which they could all be two metres apart. But every single day, um, people are having to come in, do temperature testing, testing lateral flows. If anyone's ill, stuff has to be rewritten. So it used to be that you would write your script, you would go through three drafts and it was in. Scripts are being rewritten six, seven, eight, nine times before. Um, I mean, the other day, I, I finally got my first holiday, the first time off, actually. I'm so sorry, my dog hasn't got fleas, by the way, because, <laughs> you know, scratching in the background. You're on the telly, Lily, behave. Um, there, was one, there was one episode where I literally got, I, I got on holiday, we got our first, first days off. I literally haven't had a day off and since the start of the pandemic. We got away, we just sat down for dinner on the first night and I got a phone call and the entire script needed to be written overnight because somebody wasn't available. Um, it's just one of those things, but it's, it's just such, um, I know I'm massively privileged to still be able to do the jobs that I love. So I think you've just got to grit your teeth and get on with it. And of course, in the middle of all that, I've had a toddler in the house and we've had to entertain. <laughs> She's appeared on telly a couple of times. We didn't mean to, but um, <laughs> it's, uh, you just get on with it. You've got to grit your teeth and get on with it and be glad that you're in work. I mean, that's the other thing is I imagine when you're working on a TV show like Emmerdale, all the time, you know, storylines are having to change, scripts are having to change. So it must be hard for sometimes for you guys to keep up with. So, so where, where are we at now? Which, which, which version are we doing now sort of thing? Um, do you mean for this morning? What I say on air that I don't say. No, no, no. For, for when you're actually, oh. for when you're, you know, putting together yeah. the storylines and they're constantly having to change. Well, yeah. There's, there's, there's a, about twenty four writers, um, and you just all the scripts are, are sort of uploaded so that you can read what everyone's read before and after. But um, we just have very, very clever people um, doing continuity and uh, having people in. So it's not just us. I mean, if you look over at Coronation Street, they wanted for their 60th anniversary, which of course was ages ago, that was all supposed to be the sinkhole. So people started talking about, David Platt started talking about the sinkhole down there. And then for 18 months, this story was never paid off. I think the 60th, if you had two people on, on the top of a roof with a chicken because that's all they could do um, and so it's finally this week it's all going out and you've seen the sink hall opening up these are all the stunts that they'd meant to do uh, the 60th stuff just had to be torn apart rewritten but people have just been absolutely brilliant and they've just I think what it is we all thought it this is a bit of normality in a it's it's a chance I sometimes thought I was going on this morning for example and you would have had a very heart-rending stories in the studio. You'd have politicians on with all these very scary statistics. And I'd feel a little bit like, am I being, what am I doing? I'm, I'm going on and I'm talking about fictional soaps. But I think what it is, 
is people have said to me, and I, and I think it's true, it's a chance to shut the door sometimes on, on all the stuff that's going on out there, escape into a fictional world and just have that bit of normality, which is at the corner of my screen. It should be Gail Platt shouting at David. It, it should be Paddy and Marlon having a bicker over a computer game. And it's, it's life and it's normal. And I think sometimes it's a way of, of getting your emotions out. You can laugh and you can cry. Sometimes you bottle things in so much when stuff's going on in the real world, or you have to put on a mask if you're a parent or you've got people around that you just don't want to let that mask slip. And then you can bowl your eyes out at something that you've seen on screen. So it's, it's a bit of a relief. So I think it's, it's an immense privilege to be in people's television screens and hopefully just providing that bit of escapism for them. And I think, well, I didn't see that someone else's life is much, much worse than <laughs> theirs. At least you're not in a sinkhole. <laughs> I mean, the other thing is as well, I think so many people do, because, you, you know, the soaps have been around for so long and they become part of the family. And I think people really, you know, connect with the soaps and just want to, you know, it's like keeping, you know, catching up with a member of the family that you haven't heard from for a little while. You just want to sort of know what's happening next. I did an interview once that everyone said I was mad, but I, I'm actually completely right. I said that Steve McDonald was more influential than the Prime Minister um, because um, a soap character, I think you, you trust. Uh, if you've got a message that you want to get out by putting it in the realms of a soap, it's, it's not hitting you over the head with a pamphlet that you don't want to pay any attention to, but if you see something happen to people that you love, it's a way of getting the message across. So, for example, in Emmerdale, we had the storyline where Tracy was suffering postnatal depression. And um, so what we've shown is her going through it, but also going to get help, going to the meetings, going to get therapy. Um, and we know that whenever we do a storyline like that, the calls that go through to, so, uh, to help centres just massively spike through the roof. It's 400, 500% more calls. If you do a storyline, um, very dark situations like historical abuse or, or rape, you know that people are going to be watching. It, it might resonate with something that's happened. It might encourage them to seek some resolution or assurance of, about something that's happened in their own life. So when it, whenever we do, yes, we do the bonkers stuff. I know we've got a serial killer that's running around Emmerdale at the moment, who is amazing, who is chucking people under gorges and off cliffs and trying to murder them. And we'll have bonkers fun with that. But whenever we do something that's based on, on real life, whenever we tackle something medical, we take great, great care um, our team will talk to people who've been through it we'll have meetings with people writers will talk to people who've been through it and charities we work with charities a lot and they go through the the script with a fine tooth comb and, and make sure that that bit is accurate and i think it's true if you if you see someone on screen that you have known for years um going through something i think it does get that message across much more than some politicians standing at a podium and going you must do this um so we all tend to ignore them don't we <laughs> and also i think as well compared to sort of for example a feature length film or you know a short run series you you with with a soap they do a storyline and you get to see the, the 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 true outcome from the beginning the middle and right on into you know to like present day i mean there are storylines that were started off years ago and are still being talked about now you know years down the line and you wouldn't get that in a in a film or even like a, a tv series you know or like a short run tv series well, that, that's it. And, and, and when we're storylining, um, so we might get two characters together and we'll go, oh, yeah, it's Romeo and Juliet. And then we go, yeah, but they died. Ours won't. They're going to stay. And it is that tremendous responsibility that you do need to show that, that ongoing thing. I mean, Tracy and a kidney. How many years ago is that? But that, that's got to come up and you've got to remember, we do have a list. We actually have a, a research document that's got a list of everyone's medical conditions. And so things like Jay, Jay years ago had cocaine addictions. So now he doesn't drink and we got to see him going to NA meetings and stuff. You've got to remember all this. But yes, because there are people that will relate to what you have said and written on screen and so you've got to remember it is an ongoing story but that i think it just gives all those rich layers to the the character it makes them it makes them real and makes them believable yes they do bonkers stuff but there is this core of thing that you you absolutely have a, a you a responsibility that you have to get right 
Now for you, where did the interest in writing come from? Where did, where, you know, when did you realise that that was kind of where your, your, your interests lie? Uh, well, it was an odd route in, actually. I, I uh, for my sins, I was a tabloid journalist um, for, for several years. I, I actually came to London. I, I'd worked on the Chorley Guardian and I'd interviewed Roland Rat. And I thought, wow, this is exciting. This is a showbiz, heady showbiz life. I want, I fancy this. Um, the, uh, the news editor at the paper, I'd, I'd literally just come out of college. I'd done a journalism training scheme and he said, listen, get on a train, go down to London and bang on some doors and try and get a job. Um, and this was in the mid 90s, I am that old. Um, so what I actually did was I bought uh, 50 crates of, I, I was living in a hostel, I was skint. I only had 200 pounds to my name. Um, and I thought I had to get a job by the Friday or I was gonna have to go back on the train and go back up north. Um, so I had to do it by Friday. So I spent 50 pound and I called in an offer. A friend of mine was working for Foster's Lager and I bought several crates of lager and I printed out my CV in the local shop and, and made it nice. And I stood in the reception of the Daily Star and the Daily Express building. Um, and I called down, I said, can I speak to the news editor? And they went, no. And I said, can you tell him that somebody stood in reception and she's bought beer and she'd like to see you. And down he came and there I was, and I was stood behind all these crates of lager. I said, hello, my name's Sharon, I'm really keen. I don't, I don't, you don't even need to pay me. Would you just give me one trial shift and you can have all this beer? Um, and he just burst out laughing. He went, right, fine, come in tomorrow at nine o'clock. Let's see what you've got. Um, so I started off there. Um, I had a, a hugely long career in the, uh, the tabloids. I, I worked um, right, well, what was it, about 15, 15 years as a news reporter. Um, and then I was a columnist after that. But what I would used to do, would I would ghostwrite um, for people. So I would ghostwrite their columns. Um, celebrities are uh, um, very, very interesting people, but it is a skill to distill your, your facts and your knowledge into an entertaining piece of copy. So I was Tara Palmer Tomkinson. Um, we actually did a book together. I was Jay Goody. Um, uh, she, when she came out of Big Brother, she was our, our columnist for a while. Um, I was Katie Price for a little while. I, I, I ghostwrote people's columns and I had a chance meeting with um, the head of drama at the BBC, a wonderful man um, um, uh, called John York. And he said, do you realise that what you're doing is actual script writing? Because um, what you're doing is taking the person's voice and you are writing in their voice. And I said, that, that's the bit of the job that I, I really enjoy doing. The, the actual reporting and interviewing, um, I, you start after 15 years, I, I, it started to lose its, it, it didn't, didn't hold any thrall to me anymore. But I really enjoyed this creating a piece of um, writing that people would enjoy reading. And, and by that time, I'd, I'd written a whole book with Tara um, and I really enjoyed doing it. And he said, why have you, have you ever thought about writing a script? And then he said, I said, well, actually, no, I, I will. And I had, at that point I had a soap column and I'd, I'd watched Emma Dale and Coronation Street since I was a kid. I'd watch Emma Dale my, with my grandma right back from Pollard, who she never could stand and always thought he killed his wife. Um, and I watched Coronation Street have been on in our home since I was a kid. Um, so he said, well, give it a go. And he called my bluff and he said, okay, you've got two weeks to write a script give it a go. So I remember I phoned um, Chris Park, who at that point played Spence Moon in um, EastEnders. I said, I've never seen a script before. I don't even know what they look like. I, and so he biked me all what he regarded as his best scripts was, which was all the time of, of Kat and Alfie and Spencer. And this block of scripts came through and I read it. I thought, all right, that's what a script looks like. Marvellous. Wrote my script and then got in. And he basically said, you it's all over the place, your structure is dreadful, but you've got the voice of the characters absolutely bang on, and it, because you've been watching it for years, it's, it's clear that you, you love them. And I've always kind of blundered into them. I, I always wanted to be a journalist, and I was clear about that. But I remember, I, I, I mean, I ended up writing about four or five books, but yes, with Tara, Tara PT, we both met for lunch one day. We'd both just been dumped by our respective other half, saw each other, and I just remember bursting out laughing. I was like, oh my God, you've got your slippers on. And she's like, you've got a mustache. Look at this state of us. Look at this. It's dreadful. Um, so we ended up having this really lovely, giggly, girly lunch. And I said, you know what? There's a feature in this. There's a feature in like, just get over it. Why have we done this to ourselves? Why are we letting men do this? So we wrote this sort of thousand word feature 
uh, that afternoon over a Chinese and a bottle of wine. Um, anyway, Tara being Tara, went off, met some book publisher that afternoon and um, yeah, they literally came back the next day and there were six, pu uh, six publishing firms vying saying, um, we, want, we want to publish the book of this, can you write the book? Um, in three months time. I remember we just legged it down the street to WH Smith and I was like, how many words will a book? I have no idea. We went, yes, yes, of course we can. We could, can we? Um, and then just wrote a book. So I've kind of always, I, I've always enjoyed a deadline and that chaos of a deadline of, and this challenge of just do it, just get it done, say yes, think later. Um, and so it was like that with the scripts as well. Um, it took me about two years actually to get the actual job on EastEnders. Um, so I had to go into training and um, learn how to structure everything. But John always said to me from day one, you, you've got the bit we can't teach, which is that you love the characters. Um, and I genuinely do. And I've never been ashamed of that. I, I do love all these soap characters. And I think it's a huge privilege and a pleasure that I can actually um, spend my days working with them and moulding them and um, fighting them and arguing with them. <laughs> I mean, over the years, you've obviously been involved in so many amazing storylines. Is there a personal favourite that you've been a part of that, that you, you, you still love to this day? Um, do you know what? I think my very first one I did, uh, which was over at EastEnders, and it was all the time of, of Zainab. Um, and and she was going, it was the domestic abuse storyline with Yusef, um, going back a few years. Um, but it was the very first one I wrote, to, uh, I wrote and I put, um, I put a, a lot of my, my friend's personal stories in it and I talked to a lot of people and I escalated what the script was supposed to be. And I just remembered going in for the filming and then just writing it and, and he was literally slamming her head in, into a mirror and, and we made it, we escalated it much more. I still, I, I, I got this strong feeling, I, need, I want to be scared for Zainab and I want people to know what's going on in there. And at, at that point it had all been quite sort of psychological of violence. And I just remember watching her filming and, and just seeing her do it and going, you're just amazing. Just watching an actor saying your words for the first time and it, and I just realised that's what I want to do. It, it wasn't. That's what I was always trying to get from the journalism. I was always trying to make a difference. But I saw that. I saw what she was putting an absolute heart and soul in it. And then the letters that we got from domestic abuse charities, and then the the calls that apparently were going into refugees and people coming forward. It just made me realise that I was part of something that was so powerful. And here we are, and it is a force for good that I'm working on and I think that was the moment just watching the filming that I just absolutely fell in love with this job and made, it made me realise just how important this is and, and it's something that you know you don't take lightly so that's always stayed with me and that's always been the most powerful thing that, that I've watched although it's just it's just been a, a, a huge privilege that the, the you do see the whole of human life and I, I think the people that come forward and help us with storylines, I mean, we were talking to women that have gone through postnatal depression and they're so brave. We're a room full of strangers and writers and researchers just sitting there watching them on Zoom. And these women are pouring their hearts out and saying, you know, I'm terrified I was going to hurt my baby. I, I had to give my baby up. I split up my relationship. And I'm thinking, you're all doing this because you want to help women out there who've gone through the same thing. It's, it's a tremendous privilege to be, to be part of that. And they don't get any public thanks or anything for that. So I want to give them public thanks if, if I can. It was all anonymous. It was all to be done. And I think it was what I think is so powerful is when I see men and women just coming forward to say, I want to share my experience. I want to help and learn and grow from it. And I just want to reach to other people and, and help them through it if I can through the medium and there we are back to the back to the thing that I say that a soap star is more influential than any politician because they're that's just uh, that's just something that, that they want to do and it does work it makes people come forward it makes people you know process stuff that might have happened in their lives I mean, although I really hope no one's been thrown into a gorge by a serial killer right now fingers that crossed <laughs> yeah I hope no one's in hospital because they've just been thrown into a gorge by a bad serial killer yeah. if you if you are you have my full sympathies <laughs> go to the police <laughs> now
Now, I mean, obviously, over the years, there you know there are so many amazing soap storylines. Is there one that you haven't been a part of that you've watched and thought, you know what, I wish I'd have been a part of this. This is an amazing storyline. Is there one in particular, a favourite that you haven't been involved with? Uh, for me, it's it's characters. Um, I mean, I grew up watching the whole Kem. Get Ken, Deirdre, Mike trilogy. I, I got to, I was very lucky. I've been at this morning now for 18 years and I would do behind the scenes um, on storylines that I hadn't written, but Ken and Deirdre's wedding, I was there for the second one of that. All that, the, 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 the old stars, your Pat Phoenixes. Um, I've always, I always wished I'd been able to write for Ken Barlow, but also there's a, there's a part of me that thinks, what I love is that I just watch Coronation Street for the sheer pleasure of watching it. You don't see behind the curtain, you don't see the joints. I'm just there purely as a, a viewer. But yeah, things like the cat slating, you ate my mother, that was all before my time. Just, and then Dan and Angie, I mean, when I see these people, I walk past a Hollywood star if uh, in the studio, but you know, when Pat Butcher was in there, I was fangirling like crazy. I always wish I'd been able to write for Barbara Windsor. She, um, we, we just didn't quite cross the paths. Um, I'm, I was always very good friends with her. I'm, I'm very good friends with her husband, Scott. I really wish I'd been able to put some words into Barbara's mouth. But uh, what I did was I just got lots of characters talking about her. So I do that as well with Dot and Jim. I'd have characters just talk about her. If Dot was here, actually, I did get to, I, I did get to write for Dot and that was wonderful. Um, and the best thing is she didn't change it, which is... <laughs> June Brown is an absolute bugger for changing everything. <laughs> she doesn't think it's right. So when I got it through with no changes off June, I was like, now that's your true soap queen. And I have been, I have been approved of. <laughs> now this might be a hard question for you to answer, but is there a favorite soap character that you've written for that you, every time you get to write for them, you're like, oh, this, you know, this is going to be gold. Is, is there a favorite or is it hard to pick? I genuinely, and they always used to call me a sap about this in EastEnders because you, you get to request characters and they used to go, you love everyone, don't you? And go, yeah, I genuinely do. I think there's something in everyone that I love. Um, I mean, over at um, Emmerdale, every time I get a dingle, I'm delighted. I love writing feisty women. Um, I love writing drunk women. I, I always say, give me the girls on a, on a girl's night out. And actually, when I go on a girl's night out with my friends, I start videoing us, recording us in secret, because I'm going, this has got to go in a script. I love it. Um, I love writing for Faith Dingle, because um, she can just say stuff that you can't get away with um, normally. But no, genuinely, there's, there's, there is no character that when I get the script, I go, oh, I've got them. I always... I always go, oh, brilliant, I've got that. I, I, I just love seeing what people do with it. Um, Steve McFadden over in, in EastEnders, he was always someone that I, I used to love writing for because he always took the work and he I, you usually got people's voices in the head. I mean, that's the way I write. I, I sit here, this is my keyboard, this is my working place here, I'm at my keyboard here. And I usually just sit here with my eyes shut and I just imagine the person coming into the room. And usually you can imagine the pattern. I think, what, what would they say to them? What would they do if they went in there? You know, when you've got Alfie moving, you know, we'll give it a load of pattern, be like, joke, joke, throw a line, throw a line, da 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 da, into the story point. Steve McFadden was always the one, Phil Mitchell, he always played it a different and unexpected way. Same with Linda Henry, who played Shirley. Um, very thoughtful actors. I think I would watch it on screen and I'd go, ah, okay, yeah. They've, they've, they've sat, they've looked, and they've bought something that's that's really interesting to it. Nitin Ganatra was another one that was um, really interesting um, to write for because I never knew who was the Masoods, of course. Um, I don't understand, it's, it's, it's not my world, um, but he was a wonderful thought black actor to work with because you can go, listen, it says in my script here that we don't want the person, they, they don't do this because they will be shamed by the community. What does that mean? What does that mean that you'll be shamed by the community? What happens to you? Um, and I like actors like that, that I can ring up and go, I don't understand this, it's not my world. Tell me, tell me what it is. What, what, can, I, um, what can I write to make this better? I love it when you get that collaboration with an actor that you can both work on something to make it better. But yeah, give me a bit of faith dingle, especially <laughs> on the prowl after a man. And I mean, I mean, just generally soap, soap wide, have you got, I mean, I know this is going to be a tough one as well. Have you got an all time favorite soap character, someone that you, maybe you, not necessarily that you've written for, but just that you love to watch that you just love everything about the character. 
I mean, I was brought up on Jack and Vera. I mean, Jack Duckworth is my dad. <laughs> and I got to tell him that. Um, I interviewed him, uh, luckily, for his autobiography. Um, it's, it's the old ones. It's, for me, it's Rita. Rita can just walk into the, the Rovers and steal the entire scene with, scene with one look. Your Rita's and your Audrey's and then over with us, Diane, sadly retiring now, Elizabeth essenson has gone. Um, but for me, it's the people that I've grown up watching. But then it's also the youngsters are just so tremendously exciting. I, I love watching and seeing how they grow and, and come up and just seeing how good they are um, at the moment. So uh, it's really bad. I, I'm terrible. I just go all of them. <laughs> but yeah, I, uh, for me, Jack and Vera, I don't think I've ever been so excited as when Jack and Vera, of, of, um, um, I've actually met them They're coming into the studio. It was like elbows out sale coming through i'm making them <laughs> <laughs> i mean obviously soaps are so good at hitting the drama i mean obviously this week on both emmerdale and coronation street huge weeks i mean obviously um the sinkhole in corrie we've got the the sort of kayaking trip in emmerdale when when a, a soap gets to do a big stunt like this i mean it must be so exciting for everyone involved to to just really you know put you know put everything into it well, it's, it's months and months of the planning. So if you think about what we've got on Emmerdale this week, so they've got the, the rope bridge, the uh, survival week, people falling from the rope bridge into the raging rapids, and then they were down, and then there was a waterfall. And what day are we going out? So I don't, I don't give everything so away. So we'll be going out tonight or later today. All right, so. okay, we're fine. So <laughs> as of today, we're into the burning maze maze and all the fire going up and who gets through alive. Um, what day are we on? We're Thursday. Oh, someone cocks it. Someone cocks it. It's a tragedy tonight. Um, if you just think when you're watching that action, so you've got a maze maze, it's three metres tall. That had to be planted um what was it almost a year ago in fact they planted two for reasons it will become obvious tonight why they needed two of them but that all had to be designed and planted um a year ago so a year ago and um and then we film and write six months in advance so actually 18 months ago we were all talking about a maze maze in in the meeting and what and what was going on you then have to physically get all the characters to that point so it's it's not um just the fact there's six cracking episodes that are going on in Coronation Street and uh, going on in Emmerdale this week, our, our super soap week, if you like. It's 18 months leading up to that, 18 months of leading up to let's get the serial killer in, let's get Mina in, let's get her motivation, let's make her fall in love with David and let's have Victoria coming in here, let's get their love story believable enough, let's give her a motive for going after someone, then who she spot, what are the consequences for that, is a relationship that needs to be put there, Charles and Mamprey and her coming back, and all that timing, so it's actually 18 months to go into one half hour drama that's going out that night, and I'd say that sinkhole's been going on must be about two and a half years they want to be talking about that in the meeting. So when are we going to collapse this in? Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a huge jigsaw puzzle. It, it's, a, it's an enormous machine. And I, I'm just happy as a writer, we're, we're just one tiny little cog of it. Um, but the, the brains of the people at the top, Jane Hudson and Laura and Kate and Sophie are, are we have four fabulous women um, running the show, which probably explains why we've got such amazing serial killer, female serial killers going through there at the moment, um, and good strong stories. So yeah, it is, we, we are a team, we are a family, and it, the, the amount of work that goes on behind the scenes, um, they must have been praying nobody turned up with coronavirus during <laughs> filming. They were like, don't go out, tie everyone to their beds. You're not allowed out for months in advance. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I hope people like it. It's cracking. It's amazing tonight. I mean, that's the other thing that must have been a godsend was the easing of restrictions. Because I imagine trying to do this, if you were still doing the, you know, having to do the, you know, the full length of, of restrictions would have been tough, I imagine. It's, um, we're still putting them in on set. We are still a metre apart. 
So what we've done, I'm going to demonstrate, do excuse me, because there's lots of builders coming in and just help me loft them. Um, so what we're doing, so this is Charles and this is Manfrey. So what you do is you keep them a meter apart, but then you just cheat the angle like that. So this person always talk, stands on a box, so they look the right height. So they look like they're much closer on the set, but they're actually, they've actually got that, that big gap between them. That's, that's how we do it. Um, so we've gone from two meters apart to one meter apart. But still, we've got to protect the cast. You know, it's um, uh, it, these are real people actually doing the stunts and, and, you know, real lives. We can't put them in any danger. So we're still shooting with these restrictions. It's got easier. Um, people are still, we literally were, were walking around. Um, everyone thinks we did something really technical. We literally had Val Lawson had um, a giant pole that was the right correct. She would just poke people with it if they weren't standing far enough away. Um, we're working with all the restrictions still at this morning. Um, that way, if somebody does come in and they do have the virus, no one's actually come within a metre. Lots of testing. Uh, I think people are testing about um, twice a week if they're, they, you know, they're going to do scenes. But it's been, it's been terrific that we can actually start to go. People can maybe kiss. Um, they can maybe hold hands. That we found. Hopefully, it's worked. But on the writing, we've always had to have, you know, there's just sometimes where someone's child is crying. You just want to go. The mother would go and hug them. Uh, you had a proposal where people are two meters apart and don't kiss afterwards. Um, and do you know what? I think it's, it's, it's sometimes it's just keep the show going, keep it on the screen. And I think people at home have been so forgiving of us for um, any little things like that is let's get caught up in the drama and the emotion. And um, yeah, hopefully they, uh, it, it doesn't show too much. Now, obviously, yeah, it is a relief that if they maybe slightly. Now, obviously, going forward, I mean, you know, the, the soaps will continue to do what an amazing job they do. I mean, they're all fantastic. Have you got like a dream that you would love to do a storyline that maybe you would love to see happen or or something that, that you know, if it was down to you, you would love to, to, to be involved with? Uh, do you know, what? I, I did my big one. I, I did one with um, Chaz and um, when she was uh, carrying the baby that she knew was um, that, that wouldn't live um uh that that was mine and that was i i think sometimes because i've had a lot of fertility problems which I've, I've been open about and i've had losses and that was that was my that was my big thing that i really wanted to do and to put my story in to to help people there um so i feel like I, i've done my one big thing um that i wanted to do through an amazingly powerful character which is lucy Parger, who was amazing and just so good the way that she portrayed that um, I think it's about that. I think it's, you know, I, I'm, I'm getting to the age, luckily I'm 50 now. I've got a, life, a lot of life experience. I'm a mother now. And it's about um, putting my experience in and putting my, my life in and trying to tell stories that, that I want to tell that, um, that hopefully help people. That, that's, I, I like doing that emotional side rather than, um, you know, I, I think in the past I, I would have said, oh, I like doing the drama. I like chucking people off uh, cliffs. But uh, now I'm trying to tell stories as a mother and um, as, as a woman. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully we can, I can't give too much away. We've got lots coming up. We, we pitch every single month that the writers come forward and they pitch stuff they want to do. And uh, we just hope that the, the, the soap gods in, the, in the, the top building take them on. But um, whatever we do, I, I, the stuff we got coming up in the next year, honestly, this Super Soap Week, it, it's just a start. It's so exciting, the stuff we got going. We're just going, we are, we're coming up to our 50th anniversary of the show. And uh, it's, it's going to be great. It's, it's just such a privilege to work here and be part of it. And I just briefly wanted to mention before we go about the amazing fact that all the soaps are coming together. This is, you know, it's never been done before, as far as I'm aware. So to have all the soaps kind of intermingling, that must be quite exciting for you as a, as a writer on Emmerdale to be able to sort of have other soaps involved. It's great, isn't it? Well, Jane Hudson, um, our executive producer at, this, at um, Emmerdale, wrong job. <laughs> this morning, Emmerdale, she said that one. Uh, Emmerdale, she, it was her idea, actually. Um, so yeah, you've had little references. So I know when it was Corrie's um, 50th or 60th, I, I can't remember, Doc Cotton sort of said, oh, I always like to sit down and I watch Coronation Street with a cup of tea. Um, so there have been tiny references before, but um, it's not been done before that one character will literally pop up on the screen of the other. So if you think about it, uh, uh, that again, that has been months and months in the planning. Um, we each will have a 
something to do with the, the environment, something to do with climate change. I can't say what that is just yet because I think they're all going to announce it next week. But yeah, that's got to segue into the storylines and it all, if you think about how early you had to work in advance and getting a week where it would fit in, because obviously you couldn't have a sinkhole opening in Korea and then somebody from doctors turning up and going, can I tell you about our sustainable clothing idea? It'll be more exciting than that. Um, yeah, as a, as a soap fan, somebody was saying it's like the Avengers Marvel crossover. <laughs> I think one of the most difficult things to do must have been the fact that so many soap characters have already been in one show and then they've moved on to another. So Vincent in EastEnders, that Kim's looking for Vincent at the moment going, I'm going to find out what happened to my husband, where is he? And then, then hilariously he's popping up in Hollyoaks getting shot by Warren <laughs> in the same week. And there he is. Um, so presumably it won't be him turning up over there. Kush, of course, in... in um, it, it got killed off in EastEnders, but going off being a surgeon now. Um, so, you know, and the whole BC casualty, casualty line. So that must have been an enormous jigsaw puzzle. Uh, Jay was, uh, again, that's something that's just been months and months in the planning. But um, I do remember coming into conference one day and saying, I've just had a Zoom call with all the bosses of all five soaps and all the serial dramas. If the papers knew what we were just talking about, they, I can't believe it stayed quiet for that long, um, but kudos to everyone and all the writing teams. But again, it's something that we think, climate change, everyone's talking about this big meeting, you know, even the Queen was saying, I don't know who's coming, I don't know what's going to happen. But it's just, it was a way of drawing attention to it. And I think, um, I think what Jane and the bosses were doing was saying, look, it, it's just our, it's our little nod, it's getting it to the dialogue, it's, it's getting it out there, getting a conversation started. And it's going to be in such an interesting way of doing it. Better, yes, than a politician standing up and saying, don't do this. It's much more fun to have a character and go, oh, look, it's him in that show. That's not right. It'd be great, though, if one of them could just pop into the pub and have a pint with the other. Can you imagine Zach Dingle <laughs> going into the curry bar? You're a soap fan, aren't you? Yeah, I, think, yeah. I, I think you'd love it. And then I'll say, yeah, Tracy Barlow, she'll be, she'll be having a go at King Dingle. She'll go, all right. <laughs> Steve McDonald's having a look over there um but yes yeah, so we've done a tiny little taste of it um and I hope people enjoy it and I hope it um you know I I just hope it gets a conversation started I say I can't wait to see this it's going to be fantastic um now obviously just before we go I just wanted to ask whether you had any messages for you know the the patients in hospital at the moment or to the amazing NHS staff and and key workers and everyone out there anything you'd like to say Oh, well, God bless, uh, you know, the NHS has saved my life three times. Um, so, um, you know, I, I, I couldn't believe, and I, I was, the last time I, I was in was when I was pregnant with my Betsy, um, seeing the nurses, um, how hard they were working, the length of shifts they were doing. Um, I, I just think you're all amazing. Listen, when I, when I got out of there and we're all gonna get out of here, Send them a hamper, send them a giant bottle of wine and a load of chocolate and tell them how amazing they are. Um, but uh, yeah, the NHS is, uh, had a, an asthma attack and, and went, I, mean, I didn't even know I had asthma and went to hospital. Um, and then I've twice um, been hospitalised in the, the last few years. NHS has saved my life every time. God bless you and God bless everyone in your bed. Um, as I say, I hope it wasn't a serial killer on a gorge that put you there or a sinkhole. Um, and uh, I hope you can tune into the soaps and have a little escapism and I hope you all get well soon. Thank you so much, Sharon. It's been an absolute pleasure. Of course, keep safe. And uh, yeah, fingers crossed we can speak again one day. I'd love to. I better get on and write some soaps now. <laughs> <laughs>